Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, but luckily, in the morning, there were like three amazing speakers, and they gave very nice introduction to this topic, so I don't have to go through again. But nevertheless, I will try to put the emphasis on the introduction rather than the details of my work. Of course, I will talk about it, but you can focus on the detail. Oh, no, no, introduction will be, uh, will be helpful. OK, so I'm going to start my talk with addressing like current digital like technologies. If you think about a CPU, it's a very stereotypical product of uh, digital technology. Well, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. Like two MOSFETs together. This is very, very basic building block of like a CPU. It's called CMOS inverter. So you need just a pair of PMOS and NMOS. You have like P-channel transistor and N-channel transistor. And you, you apply, you give signal, and you see the output. And this is like basic property of the CMOS inverter. Oops, it should be the other one. OK, anyway. If the, if the input is 0, the output is 1. And if the input is 1, the output is 0. You can simply just invert the signal. It's fine. Let's look at the MOSFET. This is a schematic of MOSFET, like source, drain, and there's a channel in between. And the thing is, now the people, the, the, the research of this digital technology, from the, actually from the very beginning of the invention of this kind of you know, solid state like MOSFET, and the people are trying to make the channel length as small and small. So first of all, they want to do that to increase the density of integration has something to do with money, I mean production cost. And second of all, if you decrease the channel length, you can improve the performance of the transistor. So in terms of like, you, you, you can decrease the resistance, and if you decrease the resistance, then the RC delay getting shorter and shorter. So in that way, you can make the system faster and faster. Well, how actually the CPU works is they basically have the system clock. So you have this uh, clock, like universal clock, so all this operation, like logic operation, happens like in a synchronized way, either this rising edge or falling edge. So basically, you have this system clock. And uh, then you can define the period of this uh, system clock, which is called like cycle speed, that determines the performance of CPU. It was pretty uh, promising up to like 2000. You know, the, the performance increase is quite drastic. This logarithmic scale, you see, it was drastic like that. And uh, it was really promising before 2001. And people said that, well, the improvement will be like 41% per year. So it didn't take a long time to realize that it's pretty tough. So in 2001, they thought that, OK, they overestimated the future of that. And they say that, like, OK, the progress will be like 70% per year. So in six years, 2007, oh, they say like 8%. Uh, 2011, say like 4%. That means it's almost saturated like this. So the people in this research field are in trouble now. So that's a kind of common thing, like people in trouble, what do they do is they're looking at something else. So one of them is like artificial intelligence. So which is pretty, pretty, pretty different from like, like von Neumann-based like uh, this conventional digital technology. Well, if I say artificial intelligence, so we have to define what it is. Actually, I don't have to, but what's there? So if, if you say like AI, that doesn't mean that like a machine thinking like a human being or acting like that or feeling like that. No, it's too far from that. So very realistic definition of AI is decision-making ability of things. No creatures, but things. So it's getting really popular, even in mass media. You can see very often some keywords like deep learning and supervised learning and so on, and artificial neural network and convolutional neural network and so on. So those things like deep learning and supervised learning, they are like learning method. And those things like systems, they're learning system for this learning method. OK, here comes very, very, very simple example which is 
single layer perception is very, very simple example of artificial neural network. So this is just simple structure it's here. And you have this guy, this blue ball is a neuron, so-called like artificial neuron. And you have input. Here you have like three inputs. In a mathematical way, you have three dimensional input. OK, fine. Then each input has weighting factor. So for example, this guy x1 has weighting factor of w1 and w2 and w3. And there is a bias, so-called bias. So each neuron has a bias. It's very simple. So what this guy does is he gets all the input multiplied by weighting factor and bias and makes summation. And uh, it can judge. And the output is either 0 or 1. It's binary, like digital. So, well, very, very simple, like artificial neural model is threshold neuron. So if the input is above 0, the output is 1. Otherwise, 0. It's very simple, but this will cause some mathematical difficulty while, while you calculate the neural network. So, so normally, people use this kind of you know, like continuous like, like a neural function, which is called like sigmoid neuron, and so on. All right, so you have to train this artificial neural network. How do you do that? Well, this is a very, very simple example in case of like supervised learning. So if you say like you train this network, what does that mean is you optimize these weighting factors, which are analog, not digital. So this system basically has, has this uh, binary, which is digital, neuron and analog synapses and weighting factors is continuous like that. So, all right, so what you do? You have to adjust these weighting factors. You have, that means you have to train this network with training set, so-called training set. So I will put it in one very simple example, like drinking or not drinking problem. Like you go out to drink sometimes. I don't know, some people every day. But anyway, like, let us suppose if you go out to drink, it means like number one. If you don't do that, it's zero. And think about it, there are many, many factors which determines your decision to go or not to go. Well, for example, the weather. If it's like gorgeous like today, it would be really great to go to the riverside of mines and drink some beer, right? It's very tempting. So, OK, that means the weather is a very, very important factor which can determine the result. And budget, that's also important, right? You need money to go to drink most of the time. So that's important. And day as well, like Monday, one day night, going out, it's quite high. hot, but like Saturday or Friday, the best days. So that means those are, these three factors are quite important in like making decisions. So what you need is, for example, you need a record of your drinking history, for example, last 10 years. And you put all these parameters on the same scale, and you make the history. And now what you do is you have to train this artificial neural network with the record. It's fine. So you, know, it's, uh, you just input, and there's some algorithm, like so-called like backpropagation. And this is called like error correction. So basically, you can train this network using your record of drinking. OK, it's done. If you have like 1,000, some people have more, some people have less, you can train this. Then after the training procedure, what you have is optimized weighting factors, so-called like synaptic weight. So that is called hypothesis. OK, fine. You have now hypothesis. So what you do is you can apply this hypothesis to new examples. So for example, like tomorrow, if you estimate the weather and your budget and day, and this guy will make decision if you go or not. It's smart. So this is a, a very simple example of this artificial neural network and how you do and what you do and how it works. So the point is here, you have to adjust the weighting factors to make decision. Fine. So let me talk about something more practical. Do, do you have some Facebook account? And do you know Facebook has this amazing software called DeepFace? 
The thing is, if you upload photos on Facebook, then Facebook can recognize who they are because they have this amazing software called Deface. So actually, what the software does is, OK, this charming lady, if you upload a photo of this lady, and it processes and simply just follow this neural network, like algorithm, like layer by layer and layer. What actually those layers do is it makes the information very, very abstract. So before, in case of the drinking problem, I told you the input was in three-dimensional space. But in the end, the output becomes like single scalar. What that means is you compress the input information and you filter out some wrong information and some, some information which, are, which is really trivial. And in the end, you have just single scalar value. And then you make a decision out of just single scalar value. So it makes decision very, very simple. So what this software does is it makes this feature very abstract, abstract, abstract. And she becomes like this in the end. Interesting, right? So we don't know what this means, but the software knows what that means. And finally, it makes decision, compare. But what about like digital technologies? I mean, von Neumann technologies. Well, you can make these pixels, right? And you can have this photo, and you can get all the contrast, for example, from each pixel. So what digital does is, OK, what if you have her image, but there is slight like translation, like this. And you show those two photos to your PC and ask your PC to compare. They will say, yeah, they can do. And in the end, they will say, no, they are different people because they just match each pixel. So let us suppose you have like one million pixel, and if you compare two different images, the comparison should be one million times by one million, which is very inefficient. But in this case, comparison will be done just single time, very in the end. So, so basically, this is a basic idea of artificial neural network, something. OK. So actually, the concept, this artificial neural network, has been there since 19, 1948 or 9, something. It's been there for a long time. So now, the people say, like, like, this artificial neural network is not enough. Because even though this artificial neural network is using binary neurons, but analog snaps. But what if you have analog neurons instead of binary? They, with uh, less devices, you can represent more numbers. So that's the basic idea. OK, and they call this a spiking neural network. So instead of just binary neurons, you can use the, like hardware or software too, like spiking neurons, which are very biologically plausible. So that's actually how our nerve cells work. So I mean, the thing is this uh, nerve cell, the neuron. Neuron is made of very thin bilipid layer. So it's like capacitor. OK, this is capacitor, but there's a leakage path in the, in the membrane. So it looks exactly like, like RC circuit. Basically, you have capacitor and the, the resistor in parallel. So there's leakage, and you can discharge. Or you can, or can charge the capacitor, but at the same time, discharging will happen because of the leakage path. OK, fine. So let's look at this guy. This is a spiking neuron. And spiking neurons are getting synaptic current from neighboring neurons through synapses. There are synapses, there are connections. And they're getting current and current and you see, because of this synaptic current, this membrane potential increases. I mean, capacitor charging happens. But if the uh, synaptic current stops and discharging happens, but it comes again, it increases and increases, increases and it reaches the threshold. And if the membrane potential in reaches the, the threshold, what happens is spiking. So it makes spike like that. And it moves back to the initial state, and, uh, and the same process will happen. So this is a basic like, working principle of like, spiking neuron. OK, it's fine. For example, like Facebook did a wonderful job using just simple artificial neural network. But why do we do this? Why do we need like, hardware spiking neural network, which is more and more complicated? Why do we need it? Because so far, 
software can deal with very, very limited number of input. But what if the number of input is like one million? Like if using just software technology is pretty hard to do, or you need a supercomputer for that. So of course, then the ultimate solution is making this spike neural network in hardware. So based on physics, physical behavior, which working in a self-consistent way. It's very simple. So this is like basic idea why we do this spike in neural network. All right. So to make this spike in neural network, of course, we need spiking neurons and synapses as well. So mainly, I will talk about neurons today. All right. So how can we do that? How can we make hardware spike neurons? Yeah, of course, we can learn from like software technologies. There are so-called in silico artificial neural model. So this is like the most basic model, like leaky integrated via neuron. As its name says, it integrates current, current. Then at the same time, the voltage evolution happens. And this leaky because we have the leaky path. So at the same time, discharging will happen. You simply repeat, repeat, repeat this till the potential reaches the threshold and spike fires. It's very simple, the model. I mean, it sounds very simple if I explain like that. And it's very simple if you implement it in a software technology. It's very easy. But when it comes to hardware, it's very complicated sometimes. So OK, so basic idea is, OK, we're going to take this model, and we try to build this model in hardware. So now we have to think about what neurons actually do in sophisticated neural network. So first of all, what neurons do is they make signals. So-called, they make uh, spikes. So in that way, they can train synapses as well. So OK, but it's analog, analog devices. Well, how does it work? I mean, they just make this spike. It looks like a spike or not spike. It looks like binary, but actually it's not. Because we can define the activity of this neuron. If I call this activity, you can think this activity is simply like number of spikes within a given time. So let's look at this example. This is synaptic current. If you increase synaptic current, the activity changes. So higher synaptic current, you will get like higher activity. So this is simply like encoding. So you can encode like synaptic current information into activity. But at the same time, you can decode the activity that you can guess what was the synaptic current before. OK, so this is a basic, basic role of, of spike neurons. And neurons should be like transistor. That means there should be like signal amplification. Otherwise, signal will die soon after just a couple of neurons. It depends on current though. So it should be active. It should, the signal application should be there. And, and random noise. I mean, this is very interesting, and this makes this technology very distinguishable for conventional, uh, for Neumann-based Neumann digital technologies. So we say, like, we can make active use of noise. I mean, it sounds weird, but that's true. We can do something like uh, statistics. You can, make, you can build up circuit, which makes this statistics. So, but the thing is, it should be random. So random noise, it can be noise, but it should be random, then we can use it for statistics later on. OK, so there are like a lot of different models. But today, I'm going to talk about the so-called relaxation oscillator-based leaky, leaky integrated fire neuron. Well, this very simple circuit, this is so-called pearson Hansen oscillator, which is a typical example of relaxation oscillator. So what you need is you need a so-called threshold switch and a capacitor and some resistor. That's all. You can build this circuit if you apply voltage like that. This is an example. If you apply voltage like that, what you see is this kind of spikes. OK, how can you change the activity of this uh, oscillator? You can play with this applied voltage. If you increase applied voltage, you can modulate this activity. It's perfect. It looks like, like neuron spiking, spiking neurons. All right, then let me talk about 
this threshold switch. So what this guy is, actually it's a monostable resistive switching devices, which should show this kind of S-type di differential resistance. But the thing is, it should be uh, monostable. So you can play with two different like, uh, like state. Like, uh, I would say like so-called like ground state. I hope you physicists are not really against my terminology, but you have like this ground state and excited state. You can play with that. So what happened at this uh, threshold voltage, the, uh, this excited state getting less and less and lower and a sudden transition happens. Okay, it's fine. When you decrease the applied voltage, it can keep the state for a bit till the voltage reaches this uh, free off voltage. So, but anyway, like without applied voltage, the, the ultimate stability is given to only that ground state, not the excited state. All right, so you have this uh, hysteresis, right? So this is very, very important for this threshold switch. All right, so this is a measurement result. Uh, we basically use Legamorphous charcoal light materials, which is very simple, very thin, like 100 nanometer thickness, which is sandwiched between like platinum top and bottom electrode. Well, you can make this, you know, this the capacitor structure switch and you can apply voltage, you can build this circuit and you apply voltage like that, triangular voltage. And what you see is, is kind of hysteresis. You can clearly see the hysteresis like that. Uh, yeah, of course there are way more different materials, materials classes showing exactly the same thing. For example, like metal insulator transition system, which uh, Marcelo talked about yesterday, and Shockley diode and some particular transition metal oxide system like niobium oxide or something like that. So there are more options. So if you want it, you can use something else too. Even you can modulate the uh, switching parameters like, like we on, we off and are off and are on. So everything is possible in terms of like, like material tuning or something. So what is the mechanism for this threshold switching effect in amorphous charcoal materials? Well, you can simply like think about like two different models, which is like thermal, and the other one is purely electronic materials. So basic idea about the thermal model is like, like a like hot electron effect. Like you can heat up somehow in terms of a dual heating somehow. Then electrical conductivity will, be, will, will increase because basically this germanium selenide is insulating and the, the carrier are very strongly thermally activated in the matrix of germanium selenide. So you can think about it. But the problem of this model is it's really hard to realize this kind of hysteresis because as soon as you decrease applied voltage, it immediately cools down. So it can't really keep the state for a bit. So it's really, really hard to make these stresses. So like another model, like pure electron model based on like cold electron transport. It's so-called like double injection model. So actually, I didn't suggest this model. The first suggestion was done by Mott. Yeah, you guys talked about him a lot, right? So you have like cathode and anode. Like injection of carriers, like from cathode, the electron injection, and from the anode side, like whole injection happens. And those charged carriers are basically like trapped near the, nearby the interface. And it will grow, the region will grow like that. And uh, so it will grow like that in the, mid, in the meantime, the number of negative charge and positive charge will be the same. That means it will make kind of like neutral region in between. Okay, so if you push carriers more on the other side, and the charge carrier distribution will be like that. And uh, for example, on this cathode side, this positive carrier will make the tunnel barrier very, very thin. So tunneling can happen very fluently in this case. So OK, this is like double injection model, which uh, I somehow believe happened. I'm not sure, though. All right, so let me talk about the neurons more. I mean, the thing is, like those like switching parameters, which can define the switching behavior. There are basically like four parameters, like V on and V off, and resistance of this uh, ground state and resistance of the excited state. So the interesting thing is, you can repeat this cycle 
always like those switching parameters have some distribution. So that's what you always see. You always see this variability of switching parameters. But actually, for digital technology, this is a really, really huge like, obstacle to, on the way to the mass production. So for example, like, look at this Vuillon. has this uh, distribution and variability, and Vuillop and ROP as well. So all four parameters have this variability, which is pretty bad in terms of uh, for digital technology. But for this neuromorphic application, it's good because the distribution and the correlation is random. They don't have any like, self-correlation. It's 100% like, like a random process. So the so good thing is, how am I so sure that the process, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the variability is really random, random, that you can check out this, like, you, can, you can do like, self-correlation analysis so the, as a result, you can see there is no correlation apart from like self-correlation, so-called like autocorrelation. So you can say that it's random. So what good is, is because random variability of switching parameters will make like Poisson like noise, which is exactly the same as like biological neuron. So biological neuron have this so-called like Poisson like noise. As you can see here, it's, it's, it's very similar. And, uh, but then in the end, we build like, uh, two neurons connected by synapse, and we saw how synaptic transmission can be realized in this uh, simple pair of, of neurons. So we say like N2, this neuron, and this neuron, there's a synapse, there's trans synaptic transmission through the synapse. And uh, this activity of N2 neuron, which nicely spikes like that, if you increase the applied voltage, the spiking activity increases. And this increased like, spiking activity is directly transmitted to the next neuron. So this is a result of synaptic transmission. So it's good. So far, it's nice we made like spike neural network, not neural network, but spike neurons, and we demonstrated that like, they can be like, somehow connected to artificial synapse. But here, the artificial synapse is nothing but just register. I'm not going to go through the synaptic no, uh, synapses it so much. So, like I told you in the, in the very beginning, like neural network, artificial neural network is using binary neurons, but analog synapses. So, I mean, the question is, do we really need binary, I mean, analog neurons? No, synapses, I mean, synapses. So, I don't know, this is just a just question to myself and to everybody. Aren't we really bothering like artificial neurons too much. I mean, our expectation that like neurons, no, no, I mean, oh shit, oh, sorry, the synapses, not neurons. We are expecting that synapses are analog. Well, there's some biological clue, but I'm just always you know, wondering if do we really need like analog synapses? We are putting too much like pressure on artificial synapses, probably. I don't know. All right, so. So in my talk, I, uh, I talked about it's artificial like neurons, like spike neurons, how it works, and how we can use like threshold switch to build this uh, relaxation. I, I mean, like um, a <coughs> Pearson Anson oscillator based uh, artificial neuron, and uh, so you can sh you could show that like uh, the synaptic transmission was possible. So, but the like uh, switching parameters should be optimized for the like for the improvement of a property. All right, thank you for your attention. <laughs>